Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Mind Shifters Radio with your co-host, the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice, and his wife, Jeannie. Michael and Jeannie share with you the wisdom of the ancient Aramaic internal process of forgiveness. They offer tools and support five days a week from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. They will support you in building a solid foundation within yourself to live in pure love. In Aramaic, Rachma. Michael is the author of Why Is This Happening to Me Again? For more information on Michael and Jeannie, please visit www.whyagain.com. And now your co-host, the forgiveness doctor, Dr. Michael and Jeannie Rice. And the truth that is rooted Hi, and welcome to Mind Shifters Radio with the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice. Our call-in number is 646-200-4169. Call in, give us your questions and comments, and we're also in the chat room. We look forward to hearing from you. Michael, hi. Hey, sweetie. Welcome, everybody. We're delighted that you're here. And uh, this will be our third day talking about the Aramaic Beatitudes, as well as our 38th day of the celebration of Memorial Day. And our request is that you join us in celebrating Memorial Day by assisting in disappearing war from planet Earth. How are we going to do that? Well, the root of war I would offer is hostility or fear within the human system. And to face and remove from within yourself one issue around which you have some form of hostility or fear that your mind probably shows you is caused by something outside of you, but seeing as how it's inside of you, it can't be caused by something outside of you, we invite you to forgive that, to apply forgiveness to that state which takes you out of your original human essence, which is love. Hold a newborn, you know exactly what human life is. And so we're looking to create a space on planet Earth where we can get enough people who actually choose to live a human life by eradicating hostility and fear. When we had a critical mass of that, there was an ancient teacher that said, a little leavening leavens the whole loaf. That is, when we remove what never belonged, its effects disappear. So we're here to support you in that. And if you're not familiar with the forgiveness process that we're speaking of, please uh, go to our website, www.whyagain.com That's www.whyagain.com On the right-hand side, you'll see a link that says Download Worksheets. First three items will give you the full story on how to do the forgiveness process from the Aramaic. So, not about letting other people off the hook, not about letting yourself off the hook. Never forgive yourself again. Never forgive anybody ever again for anything, please, because you can't. Forgiveness is the tool with which you go inside yourself and change what's happening inside of you. So we're delighted to, to have you here. Our calling number here is area code 646-200-4169. We'd be delighted to hear from you if you're working with the tools and how that experience is going for you and how we can support you in deepening your understanding and use, in particular, of the tool of forgiveness. Of course, there's a whole series of worksheets, a whole series of tools that we do. So we're delighted that you're here. Jeannie, do we have any questions in the chat room or any callers? No? Okay. Jim and David, welcome, gentlemen. How do you both be today? Beautiful, thank you. Thank you. I have a, a, a topic you might want to look at if you get through your Beatitudes uh, from, our, from our group last night. Awesome. That'd be fun. I look forward to hearing about that. David, how do you be today? I'm doing very well. Doing very well. A little warm here today, and other than that, things are going well. Awesome. Very cool. Or very warm, I guess. Pardon me. I didn't mean to belie what you said. (laughs) That's okay. I'm glad that you're here. 
talked to Terry this morning. He said he's doing well. We're actually setting up. You might want to check our schedule. Actually, it isn't on there yet, but it will be a little later today. And uh, Friday night in Asheville, North Carolina, we'll be doing at a place called, uh, oh, dear, what's the name of the restaurant? Posana. Posana Cafe in Asheville, right downtown, across from the monument. We're going to do a free Why is This Happening to Me Again workshop from 6.30 to 10 o'clock. So Friday night, 6.30 to 10 o'clock at Posana Cafe. And actually, a group of us are going to get together, if you'd like to meet uh, meet me, if we haven't met before. And uh, Tony Tony, the author of uh, The Get Clean, Go Green Eco Diet, will also be there. Uh, I believe Verado Live, the gentleman that does uh, Asheville Magazine, is going to be there with his wife. So there will be lots of folks to meet. If you'd like to join us, we're going to plan to have dinner at 5 o'clock. Now, dinner won't be free. We won't, we won't be picking up the tab for dinner. I apologize. But the workshop will be free. And uh, I haven't been to the restaurant yet, but they tell me it's an awesome, organic, uh, uh, gluten-free restaurant that is just fabulous. So come and join us at 5 o'clock. We're going to get one big table and hang out and play a little bit. And then 6.30 we'll begin. Why is this happening to me again? Posana Cafe, Asheville, North Carolina, right across from the monument. Right, You can park in the parking garage and just walk across the street and you're right there. So we're delighted you're here, and the Beatitudes, we've uh, we've talked about the opening word uh, in the Beatitudes, which is an important component. Uh, we're, we're told in Greek, in the translation, that it says, blessed are they, blessed are they, blessed are they, blessed are they. It must be a pretty important concept. Uh, the word was used so many times, but actually it's got nothing to do with something or somebody coming along and blessing you. There's no justification for translating the word tubehun as some kind of a bestowed blessing, especially something that comes from the outside. But rather, what it speaks of is the fact that most humans have an unconscious neural structure, an inactive neural structure, and people say, well, ah, come on now, they didn't understand neural structures 2,000 years ago. Oh, you would be amazed at what they understood. We are so primitive today, it's just unbelievable. But the word that's been translated as a blessed day is tuvehun. It's a three-part word. It speaks about possessive, like as in owning something. And the thing that it speaks about owning <coughs> is a tuv. Tuv is a neural structure, an attitude of mind. And it's about how to activate the highest level of activity in the human mind to correct the human mind's mistakes. And each of the Beatitudes is a how-to, how to change the conditions in the mind so that the unconscious neural structure, and what it says specifically in that word, Tuvehun, is that, the creator put in your mind neural structures which will guide you when they are active. If they are inactive, you who follow these instructions will come into conscious possession of and be able to use this latent guidance system designed to make available thoughts and actions that will increase your happiness and well-being. And then just quickly, the first beatitude historically says, blessed are the poor in spirit. In Aramaic it says, you who have a home in the active forces from the creator. Yours will be a heavenly estate. Second beatitude, historically interpreted as blessed are those mourning their wrongs, they will be comforted. In Aramaic, what it says is, you who love truth and profess your errors in the errors of your society, you shall be freed of mental stress. Awesome, awesome promise there, and it works. We've watched it for years since we uncovered this and discovered it and watched people working with the tools. The mental stresses that disappear are just amazing. The third beatitude Traditionally, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. In Aramaic, what it says is, you who have humility, the mental quality of perceiving, and cooperating with the good desires of others, you shall gain the earth. And then the final one that we covered yesterday before the show closed was, historically, uh, to the Greek translations, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. Good justification for that old righteous indignation that you'll hear so many talk about. 
But in Aramaic, what it says is, you who hunger for the mind structure underlying the attitude, judgment, and behavior described as just and fair behavior between people, you shall attain it. And then the next beatitude, which we haven't talked about yet, historically, it uh, translates as, blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. And uh, in Aramaic, what it speaks about is, again, this, each of these beatitudes start with tuvehun. There's a neural structure there if it's inactive. What is it that makes it inactive? When we load our minds with hostility and fear, it creates a layer over this neural structure that's supposed to be at the root of perception. It's the thing that keeps us on track. So the idea is if you can pick up on these as a set of instructions to begin to embody them, that neural structure will become activated in you. So it says in Aramaic, as opposed to the merciful, it says, you who have pure love encompassing judgment and behavior. Now, of course, that would lead to mercy, but that would be the effect. And you'll notice that most of these speak about the effect without telling you what the cause level is. And in Aramaic, the cause levels are, there's a how-to. So it isn't just have mercy, because if your mind is programmed with all kinds of hostility, fear, rage, grief, and pain, it's going to be difficult to have mercy uh, except as a kind of a, well, okay, I'll be big about it, I'll have mercy on you. And that's not what it speaks of here. It speaks of a piece of work that each of us needs to do. And that is that we have a condition of a human life, pure love. In the um, first, when they talk about, when Yeshua talked about the first law, that first law in Aramaic, it doesn't have anything to do with loving your neighbor, God, or yourself. That's a great translation, but what it says is, in Aramaic, what, what the man Yeshua was saying was that you need to maintain a condition called rachma in your mind when you think of God, neighbor, and self. So this condition of rachma is actually a filter over the frontal lobes of the brain. And so here in this beatitude, they're saying you need to keep this filter going because this is what creates the condition of pure love that leads to mercy. And you watch people and they, you know, few people want to actually do the work required to produce the result. They say, well, just tell me the result. Give me the list and I'll act that way. It's like, you can't act that way. If you get the list of how all the results look and you say, well, I'll just do all the results without having the cause of the results, you'll end up being a hypocrite, which, of course, all of us are to some degree because we've all got a certain amount of work to do. But... No matter what the condition in your life, no matter what the circumstances in your world, you can create a space in you where this thing called brachma, it's a filter over the frontal lobes of the brain, where you keep it active no matter what's going on outside of you, no matter what's going on around you. The way Yeshua spoke about that <clears throat> was he said, I'm in this world but not of this world. Now, most everyone, when we listen to our culture, is of this world as well as in this world. So something comes along and they say, Charlie made me mad, and Mary made me sad, and Harry made me angry, and Hortense caused me to go into grief, and on and on and on goes the list. Excuse me, folks. You're not designed to be of this world. You're designed to be of another world, and that is the human world. What is human life? Hold a newborn child. You know exactly what it is. This is the condition that was called the first law. And so this particular beatitude speaks of you who have pure love, that you keep this condition active, and it encompasses your judgment and behavior. So that no matter what happens in your life, every judgment, everything, every situation upon which you are called to act, you maintain a condition of love. And therefore, your behavior, and it's not about, many people say, well, just tell me how to behave. No, there's no list that can do this. What Yeshua about was, was about cause law, not effect. Effect law is, give me the list and I'll behave that way. Cause law is, how do you get to where that becomes your natural estate? That becomes the condition you just naturally function from. And so, it is this condition called rachma. And, of course, 
uh, the, the Greek translations to speak about the effect. Well, just be merciful, then, then you shall obtain mercy. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. In fact, it's interesting when you go back and you hear the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they ask Yeshua, you know, what's most important in the law? The word that they used in Aramaic was a word that represented the customs of the people, the behaviors of the people. What's most important in that? Because that was their focus. And he actually corrects them. He does not use the word they used when he replies in Aramaic. He says the most important thing in the Pokdani, in the cause law. So here he's giving us the keys to cause law. And all of this, sadly, was hidden in a comma when they brought this down from the Greek. Now, if you go back to around the third century, there was a big um, meeting, and everybody voted on what scripture. Like, humans get to vote as to what goes into the scriptures that make them scriptures. And if you go back and read the accounts of that, there was so much infighting and backbiting and so much hostility and fear and rage to come out and say, this is, this is the word of love is pretty bizarre. But anyway, what Yeshua talks about is Pogdani, the cause law. So when you understand this filter in the frontal lobes of the brain and you keep it active, you have pure love and your judgment and behavior will be impacted in the direction of that pure love. And what it says is the result of that is you will therefore receive pure love. That will be what you'll create in your world. Then the next uh, beatitude, classically uh, interpreted as Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Again, an effect. Well, just be pure in heart. You know, if you're feeling angry, just don't feel that way. Just stop it. Well, in Aramaic, what it says is, you who have a completely purified mind. Now, you notice that the man's saying, you have some work to do. Not some magic wand is going to wave over you if you say the right words and everything will be okay. He's giving us an instruction set here. He's giving us a how-to. He's not giving us a nice philosophy. So he says, you who have a completely purified mind, you will comprehend the invisible source of creation. What would a completely purified mind look like? That would be a mind where, no matter what happened in your world, there would be no capacity for any form of hostility or fear. Now, of course, if you're living on top of a thousand generations of rage and guilt and fear and pain and trauma, it's going to be pretty tough to have a completely purified mind. So guess what? There's work to be done. And you can't just say uh, magic words and somebody's going to fix it for you. This is your work. This is our work. And when we see family systems where there's rage and separation and grief and pain, and each individual in that family system takes responsibility for the condition of their own minds, then what's going to happen is that they will achieve this completely purified mind, this state where the mind is continuously plugged into the active presence of Rachma. Rachma is the pure love. It's the gateway to which human life comes in the human system. And it happens in the frontal lobes of the brain. So, as you develop this completely purified mind, you will comprehend, it says, the invisible source of creation. The classic interpretation says, the pure of heart, they shall see God. Before I move on to the last one that we're going to talk about at this point, does anyone, uh, any questions in the chat room or any phone calls? No? Well, folks, we would love to hear from you. Uh, and, and Tim, we'll, we'll get with, uh, with your situation from the... Uh, Support group last night, I'll be excited to hear about that. <clears throat> but if you'd like to call in, you have a question about anything we're talking about. If somewhere, somehow this doesn't make sense or, or how do you do it, you know, our whole show every day is more of how you do it, how you step into it. And, of course, if you go to the website on the right-hand side, download worksheets, and the first three links will give you the main, main, main major key of how to change the internal conditions of your mind. And then the last beatitude we're going to speak about at this point is the one that historically is interpreted as blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the children of God. So, you know, what does a peacemaker look like? Is that the person who stands out there with the placard that says fight for peace? Is that what it takes to be a peacemaker? 
Well, not exactly. As you might expect, if you look at the Aramaic, what this beatitude says is, you who through service, so, so here's the essence of it. There's a neural structure in you, and if through service you do this, it will assist in that neural structure becoming the active tube, the active attitude of mind that then will underlie all of your perception and behavior. If that's not active, then what underlies your perception is behavior is the good old family feeling. It is the power person dynamics. All the stuff we spoke about from the, uh, the codependence work that we started off about, oh, maybe five or six weeks ago now. If you want to go back and listen through some of the shows, they're on the archives on whyagain.com. But this one speaks about the fact that there's, it, 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 I, I see it as kind of almost like it's our rent for being on planet Earth. And it says, a latent neural structure implanted by the creator to guide you to happiness and well-being will become your conscious possession. You who through service work effectively to produce the peace and understanding under and in accord with the creator's will. You will be called the children of God. So we have in us uh, a literal state that can be at the root of everything our minds do. And you recall we <clears throat> quoted David Bohm, one of the most eminent physicists of our time and of all time, where he speaks about sustained incoherence, that the problem with humanity today is in our thought and in our thought being a state of sustained incoherence. And what he goes on to say is that we see a problem, we think about the problem, we say, well, I'll apply my thinking to that and see if I can fix it. And what he says is, our thinking is the problem. And so what the Beatitudes are doing is it's, it's going back and it's showing us how to correct that state of stinking thinking, that state where there are conditions in your mind that don't belong there. Or, and, you know, it, we, we call it the mind, but the truth is all of this is about cleaning up what we call the non-being or the replicant mind, and that is the mind that just replicates the same behaviors. You walk into the same situations, the same brain cell fires, and there it is. The mind replicates whatever's in it, or, again, what, what's been called the mind. But it really isn't a mind. It's just a device that stores information and plays that information out over and over again. And so if you choose through service to work effectively to produce, and I think if, you, uh, if we ask David, if we ask Tim, if we ask Jeannie, what's been one of the most beneficial things you've done in your own process and in your own work, each of them will tell you it was when I started to teach it. You know, Nene called in the other day, and it was absolutely awesome. We went to this center where they work with sexually abused children in the immigrant population. And, uh, we had a couple of folks there from Juilliard, other artists and such, and these artists work with these kids. And we taught the, and it's down in the Spanish-speaking part of Miami, we taught the worksheet and the workshop, why is this happening to me again in English? And Nene taught it in Spanish. And uh, she called in just the other day. This was a uh, week ago Sunday. And she said, you know, it was if you weren't on the show, she's like, it's just so awesome. My mind has become so clear in terms of so many of the principles and such a deeper level of understanding. Uh, and so as you teach it, work effectively through service. It takes service. That's, that's kind of the rent. And produce the peace and understanding that comes with the active presence of love. And what the result is, that, that Beatitude says in Aramaic, is you will be called the offspring or the children of the Creator. And, Jenny, you look like you have a thought for us. Actually, Nene is on the line, and, or not on the line, but she's in the chat room, and she has a question. And it says, hold on, let me roll back up to it. Well, it has disappeared. There's a lot of people zipping in and out. But it was basically any time we have to cancel a goal, is it always linked to pain? Is that why we have to cancel it? Okay. Well, the basic idea of forgiveness in Aramaic 
in the Aramaic language, <clears throat> pardon me, the word forgive, the word that's been translated through the Greeks uh, translations, uh, comes out as forgive, but the word is shebang, and it more literally translates, more correctly translates to cancel. And the thing that determines out of the mass of data that's in us firing at any given moment, the thing that determines which data your mind's going to use to produce its output, its reality, is the goals that you hold. So let's say you're walking down the street and uh, you're in a big city and you walk past a thousand people and you're just kind of humming a tune, having a good day, just walking down the street and, you know, enjoying the energy of everything and everybody. You're in delight. And you literally pass a thousand faces. You perhaps look at them and you smile and you nod ahead and, and you walk through the crowd and nothing in particular happens aside from your state of delight and joy at walking down the street. But let's imagine that about halfway through the crowd, person face number 500 out of 1,000 is someone who five years ago stiffed you for $10,000. And you just heard recently that they came into an inheritance where they've got $2 million. Now, you don't have any sort of behavior aimed at any one of those 1,000 people until this one face shows up for whom you have a goal. I want my 10 grand back. And all of a sudden, brain cells start to fire. They don't fire because of that person's face. They fire because you have a goal related to that face and that person's behavior. I want my money back. Now, that may prompt one person. You know, let's just go through some of the possibilities. It may prompt one person to smile at them, say, hey, how you doing? I hear things are going well. You just came up with a, you just got an inheritance. That's awesome. Can we take care of that 10 grand? And that might just be a genuine smile and you're in a good space and it's fabulous. Or it might be a, a statement and another person walking down the street with the same goal according to the content of their own replicate mind, might in rage go over and get in their face and scream at them about, you better give me my money, I heard you got an inheritance. Someone else might, you know, maybe you were walking down the street with, uh, with a mutual friend, and that face may trigger a goal to get your money back and, this mutual friend is a better friend of theirs than you are. And so it might prompt a different behavior, all behaviors related to goals and goals related to content. So you might turn to that friend and say, hey, there's Charlie that owes me that 10 grand. Would you go talk to him and see if you can get that straightened out? I had conflict with him last time I saw him. Now, all the circumstances are the same, the walk down the street is the same, you're the same, the thousand people you pass, the 500 face, the person who stiffed you for the 10 grand. The difference in, in, in the three minds is the content of the replicate mind, the content of the mind that just repeats its patterns. And so the person who, with a smile on their face, could go over, pat them on the back and say, hey, glad to see you're doing well, heard it's going great, can we take care of that money? genuinely does it with a connected space and lovingly. And that behavior maintains their human life. The person who is having a great day and all of a sudden is in a rage is in this world and of this world. That face triggers the goal for the money and the rage at having been ripped off. And so that person's behavior is different. They give up their human lives according to what triggers their goals and they're run by the content of the past. And the person who turns to the friend has a different behavior. Everything else is the same. The only difference for those three people, and, and it, you know, we could have a, a thousand different uh, variations on the theme, but the only difference is the content of the mind. Here's our input. You know, we quoted David Bohm, sustained incoherence. The thing that... Act or, or, or informs us 
that we are in a state of what David Bohm called sustained incoherence is that we have some form of hostility or fear attached to the output of the mind and the behavior that we're prompted to do by the mind. Now, we defined earlier human life. Human life is the active presence of love. So if you lose your human life, if you give that up to some form of hostility or fear, obviously you're in trouble. And, you know, when Jeannie introduces the why is this happening to me again workshop, the first thing she does is ask the question, how many have ever done something they regret? And then ask everyone in the room to go back to a point where they did something that they regretted, tap into what they were feeling at the moment they did that, and put a word to what they were feeling that prompted them to do the behavior that they now regret. Now, quite the contrary of the answers we get when we ask people to describe their newborns, those words are always love, awesome, presence, purity, beauty, sweetness, innocence. But the person who did what they regretted 100% of the time in 100% of the cultures around the planet where we've asked this question, it's always some form of hostility or fear. So obviously hostility or fear is a problem. And there are people who will say because they've never perhaps in conscious memory, had their mind operating out of the active presence of love, thinks that that's the way to survive. That's the way to make it in the world. You just have to be tough and, you know, do whatever. But always it leads to a regret. And the reason for that is because when hostility or fear is active, and make no mistake about it, hostility or fear will only be activated in you by a goal that you hold. And when it's active, what it does is it reduces intelligence. It takes us out of our state of original being and the whole mind that we have as human beings, and it puts us into a narrowed frame of mind. It puts a set of blinders on us that limits our behavior and leads to doing things that we regret. So whenever you load a goal in your mind, and that goal activates some form of hostility or fear, what the man named Yeshua would counsel you to do would be to shebag or to cancel that goal. You cancel the goal not because you don't deserve what it is you want, not because you can't have it. You cancel it because it links to your hostility and fear. And when something links to hostility and fear, it tends to take you out of love, out of being, and put you into a lesser state of, of, of um, intelligence. And so by canceling the goal, what happens is you collapse the projection that something outside of you is causing your problem, and you get to look into the deepest parts of your own mind. And where you find hostility and fear, and you bring love, that hostility or fear, which oftentimes is multi-generational, all of a sudden begins to dissolve. And as it dissolves, you end up uh, living at another level of the active presence of love. Another situation in which perhaps yesterday you could not maintain a human life, whereas now, today, you can. So first order of business would be whenever you load a goal into your mind, become conscious, start to observe the goals that you hold. And we have thousands of goals. Uh, you know, one of the things our culture has not taught us to do is to cancel goals. And every time you load a goal in your mind, you create a stress. And the functioning purpose of the mind is to show you behaviors with which to alleviate your stress. Behaviors sourced out of hostility or fear always lead to higher states of stress. And so you cancel the goal, again, not because you don't deserve it, not because you don't want it, not because there's anything wrong with the goal. It's just that you get stupid whenever you load that goal in your mind. And you want to clean that stupid part up. You want to clean out the hostility and fear. And then at the end of the worksheet, you may reestablish the goal, and that's awesome. Reestablish the goal. And if it leads to another layer, another level of hostility or fear, great. There's your next uh, forgiveness project. Now, there is an advanced state, a, a state that goes forward from that, and that is that there are many people who once they've worked on forgiving around the hostilities and fears, start to forgive, start to cancel the goals that bring forward loving content. Well, gee, Michael, that doesn't make sense. Well, if you think about it, if you're designed to live out of 
your human being life and your human being mind, which means at every moment, at every instant, you're alive, you're in the creation, you are in no way, shape, or form dependent on anything from the past or the replicate mind. You are just alive and here and experiencing a human life. I'd offer that's what we're designed to do. If we load a goal and we start seeking for something out of our past, even if it's something wonderful, so our mind serves up this wonderful memory of, you know, this event, and, and if we start setting goals to try to recapture that, then we've still given up our lives to the replicate mind. And again, the replicate mind is simply, it's, it's much like a computer function in this body-mind unit. This device stores information, stores frequencies, everything it experiences, and then plays it out on demand. Demand means something or somebody shows up, resonates a goal, or you set a goal, and the replicate mind serves up whatever it holds. Come to the point where you put everything in the replicate mind on neutral, and now what you've got is just a database of information. Need some information from this? Okay, cool. I have some information about that. There it is. It doesn't run you. It doesn't produce the world you live in as a perception. It's just there as an advisor. In the ancient teachings, it was called a servant. And the man named Yeshua said, you know, those, those who are bound by the servants in their own temple, their own household, are in real trouble. If hostility, fear, or even memories of love control you, those things take away your present moment experience of your human life. To forgive all of those dynamics is to return to a true human life that lives as the active presence of love 24-7, 365, everywhere you go, everything you do, everything you see. And it opens just awesome new spaces. So canceling the goal is a, is a, a key and that's the core of forgiveness from the Aramaic. And, you know, it, it, this is a very brief explanation, but I invite you to really work with that tool and watch the awesome results that happen. Jeannie. Okay, in the chat room, um, she says that she understands that now, and that's cool. She says, I had a deeper understanding, and also many things stirred up at deeper levels as well. I've had a week with things falling apart, and I choose Rekha. And then someone else says, what if the person that you walk up to and ask them for money and they are very obstinate and they say no and you really want the money? And then Tim commented on there, "Um, unachieved goals continue to run in my mind using my resources and when they get triggered from the unconscious, then they drive my behavior and I don't see why. And then um, Nene asks, what do you mean by resources? And then he answers, my strength, my mental energy, my ability to concentrate, et cetera. So she wanted to know if, um, what about non-achieved goals or unachieved goals? Are they also linked to hostility and fear? And then Tim responded that unachieved goals will continue. Pardon? I just needed her comment again. Oh, okay. Cool. So so two things. The idea of forgiveness is that if you find this body's mind, or what we're calling the replicate mind, the non-being mind, running your life, you want to forgive whatever's there. You want to get rid of it. Now, what about walking up to the person who owes you the $10,000 and they totally spurn you, belittle you, puke all over you, just drag you into the mud? Well, you have two choices. You can say... Oh, poor me, the victim, look what you've done to me, and now I am sad and afraid and feel bad about myself. You can do that. They're just realities from the replicate mind, and those realities can be forgiven. Or you can stand in the face of the person who would spurn you and puke all over you, and you can be the active presence of love. You don't have to be run by that. If you are run by that, then you're run by your past. You're, that's the definition of the, the servant 
binding the master. You want to tell your mind what to do. You don't want it telling you what to do. So the the idea is to awaken to who you are in the moment and maintain your human life, whatever somebody else is doing. Now, does that mean you just let them walk all over you? No. No, it might mean, well, now that I know you have the resources, this is a point where uh, I'm going to be making an appointment this afternoon with an attorney, and we're going to uh, start a lawsuit uh, for me to recover my $10,000. Love you, brother, but, you know, this isn't appropriate, this isn't right, this isn't reasonable, and what I'm going to do is do whatever action I need to take uh, in order to recoup my losses. But do I want to give up my human life for that? Do I want to give up the active condition of love in my mind because somebody decided to rip me off for money? Is it worth giving up my human life for? I, I, I offer absolutely not. And as you function out of your human beingness, which is love, you start to create your life totally and completely differently. And you may choose to hold somebody totally, completely accountable for what they're doing. And, and as you let go, as, as Tim is talking about there, that when you, it, it's like a computer. When you load your first program, when you turn your computer on, hey, everything's zippy, snappy, works well. You load two programs, hey, it's just rocking right along. You load three programs, well, it's slowing down a little bit. You get ten programs open, it crashes. Every time that you load a goal into your mind, and uh, uh, Nene, I'm pretty sure you've got the Getting the Stress You Need video. You might want to watch that. This would be a perfect place with these questions in mind to watch the Getting the Stress You Need DVD. And so when you... Load goal upon goal upon goal upon goal upon goal. You've got goals for today and goals for tomorrow and goals for next week and next month and next year and 10 years from now like the culture teaches you to do. What happens is you become overloaded with stress because each of those goals uses up resources. It's just like memory in your computer. When only one program is working, things are rocking right along. When 10 programs try to operate and, and, and try to go for memory at the same time, what happens? It, can't, it doesn't have enough resources to continue efficiently. You continue, you move forward in your life efficiently, one goal at a time, rather than trying to take on the whole world uh, of things that you have to do. One issue at a time gives you full intelligence. And if you have several background goals running continuously, what that will tend to do is it will tend to reduce intelligence. It will tend to reduce your capacity. You know, there's some Harvard research that says in a time frame where 10,000 brain cells fire, the max amount of information that goes into conscious awareness is nine bits of data. So uh, let's, and, and there are different numbers, but the key here is not precisely the number, but just to recognize that on a conscious level there's a very tiny tiny space for information to show up and you want to keep that space as cleared out as possible because if you've got nine bits you and, and the nine bits are clear you're going to have a pretty high level of intelligence if you fill up you know it, it, there are a lot of people who live in a world let's say of i'm right you're wrong it's settled why argue so they go around with this chip on their shoulder always trying to make sure that somebody else is wrong for what's happening in their lives well if that's a background program running out of a nine-bit mind, that might use up two bits of data, two spaces. So now this person's functioning out of a seven-bit mind. And then let's say they carry uh, another thought of, well, you know, seeing as how I'm right, you're wrong, it's settled, why argue? I know there are other people out there who are always trying to get me, therefore I have to protect myself all the time. I really have to be on guard all the time. Gee, in order to keep myself protected and, you know, and keep, you know that, that's the, the essence of ADD is I have to protect myself all the time. Or there's maybe another three bits filled and in use. So now this person's down to a four-bit mind. Not going to be very intelligent. Not going to be able to take care of things the way they normally take care of it. And so as you keep your goals to an absolute minimum in the moment, and few people would know when the, when the man named Yeshua said, sufficient for the day are the evils thereof, that he was speaking about stress management. And that word evil in Aramaic, a proper translation of that word is unripened or incomplete. What he was saying was, keep your goals to a minimum. No more than the goals 
that you can achieve in the next waking day, the next waking hours. So sufficient for today. It's kind of, and it, it, you know, that's one that reflects in the AA philosophy. They say one day, no, you don't have to quit drinking forever, just today. Just quit drinking for today, one day at a time. And that's the same thing. Same thing. If, you, if someone who's got a problem with alcohol or drugs says, okay, I'm going to quit for life, all of a sudden that elicits a whole series of goals and the mind goes into overwhelm and intelligence is reduced. So sufficient for the day are the evils thereof, are the unripened or the incomplete things, means only work on one goal at a time. Have your list for the day. Don't go beyond the day. Set your goals for the day and work one item at a time. And as you do, you'll have a full 9-bit mind available. If you have a, these other background things running, then the 9-bits won't be available and there'll be a tendency for there to be a reduction in capacity and intelligence. Does that make sense of your question, Nene? By the way, I want to thank you again for taking on teaching the, the workshop in Spanish. It was absolutely an awesome experience to be down there. And on Chrome Avenue, a lot of people have heard of Chrome Detention Center, not too far away from there. We did a workshop a week ago Sunday, and then they taught in Spanish as I taught in English. And it was just such a warm, receptive audience and such an awesome experience. So thank you for that, Nene. All right. So, Dr. Tim, you sound like you had a happening in the uh, support group. For those who don't know Dr. Tim, it's Dr. Tim Hayes. He runs a support group, actually, that David Hayes originally started before he went to Heartland. And when he went to Heartland, he asked uh, Tim if Tim would uh, would take the support group and, and run it. And that was about six years ago. Or, well, no, I guess it's a little less than that. Uh, and David showed up at Heartland to spend a year to be on the support team. And that was how long ago, David? That was four years ago, five years ago. And here you are still at Heartland. But Dr. Tim has picked up that support group in uh, Crystal Lake, Ohio, or Ohio, Crystal Lake, uh, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. And that's an open support group if anybody's up in that area that wants to join them on Tuesday night. So, Tim, share with us what happened. Well, we were doing work around... Um on creating consciously was that we watched the first half of that video last night and um then in the discussion afterwards people were talking about the difference between actually doing my work and cleaning things out so that when I'm in a situation that would normally make me angry I'm no longer triggered to anger and the difference between that and going unconscious and what are some of the telltale signs that you can use to figure out whether or not you've actually done your work and cleaned out the anger or frustration within you so it's no longer there to be triggered, or you've just gone unconscious and you're thinking you're fine and you're calm and the other person has the problem and you don't have a problem. So I thought you might want to address that a little bit today. Cool. Yeah, that's a great question. And... I think that um, what it takes is the ongoing, you know, if somebody lives in a world where, you know, I have to be Mr. Nice Person, I have to be perfect all the time, then the tendency when some form of hostility or fear is activated will be to deny and dissociate from that. And it's the ongoing, my, my highest thought would be that it's the ongoing doing of your work that will inform you accurately about what it is that's going on. And as you, you know, one of the things we've talked about is becoming the thinker apart from the thought, the feeler apart from the feelings, the actor apart from the actions. As you step back and observe your mind in operation, you see that and you observe the physiology, what's happening. Gee, have I got some tightness in my leg or in my ankle or in my throat or in my jaw or in my buttocks? You know, if there's tightness, there's one of the signals that says, ah, you're hiding something from yourself. The most um, rewarding one to watch signal is, just watch what you're doing with your breath. As you are in a situation and the unconscious dynamic is to hold your breath, and, you know, it's a great thing to have people around you that will support you and observe you and, 
you know, if you're holding your breath, say, gee, what's happening with your breath right now? And you go, oh, I'm holding it. What am I hiding from myself? Every time that you're holding your breath, you're hiding something from yourself. And so that's a really good indicator is that holding of the breath. But just developing discernment and watching your own physiology, I think, becomes the key to that. And if we spend a lifetime in denial and dissociation, it's going to take some time and some practice to get past that state of um, of denial. Did any other uh, thoughts come up in the in the group as that question was was fronted? Well, what I came up with as a as a guide for them was from my own experience that the the first thing is I want to keep looking at my results. You know, you were talking about ask and you receive and um, knock and it shall be opened and all of these from the creating consciously lecture. And one of them was, how do you tell? You tell by the fruits of your labor. You tell by the fruits of your work. So I said, that's one of the ways to tell whether or not you've gone unconscious or you've actually processed the garbage within you so that it's no longer there to be triggered because if you process the garbage so it's no longer there to be triggered when you're in what you think is that state of love and presencing it things will eventually get better in your interaction with that other person maybe not in that very moment but over time it'll get better whereas if you've gone unconscious you'll find you're running into the same stuck point over and over and over again um and that's eventually what happened to me is that over a period of 10 days, I kept having the same basic conversation with a significant person in my life, and there was no movement, no progress, no shifting, and it just kept cycling back through until I eventually got upset, and the upset then burst through and and had me realize, okay, there's a lot going on here for me. And then in the process of doing my worksheets and breathing and tapping, I realized, oh, I had gone unconscious days and days before about a critical set of issues. So but, but all of the things that you just said, we did talk about how it's, you need to be in the process and doing your work. And if you're able to actually experience that feeling of the presence of love, uh, but the other thing was to look for the fruits, and don't, and not, don't have to panic about it because, as you say in a number of your lectures, when you're holding something that's less than love inside your energy system, it's the job of the universe to come along and kick you right in the limitations because that stuff doesn't belong in you. And if I don't get the message the first time, the universe is going to come along and tell me, okay, here's your lesson again. Are you ready to look at it this time? Yeah, it's a big bummer. I, there is a book about that too, I think, Jim. I think it's um Why are they doing this to me again? Why, why are they doing this to me again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which by the way, folks, if you're new to the show, uh, of course, one of the ways we support our work is uh, through the sale of our books and tapes, DVDs and such. Pardon me, we don't do tapes anymore. So you'd certainly be welcome to go and order it online, but you're also welcome to go and download it free in English, German, Russian, Spanish, and Farsi several other languages underway. And the book has been translated into Swedish, but uh Swedish publisher wouldn't let us put it online free. But it's there to download, start to work with it. And, and that brings up another thought, too, and that is that you're certainly welcome to uh, to go to our website, whyagain.com, if this show is, is supporting you, if it's making sense to you and uh, is helping you to make a difference in your life. One of the ways that, uh, that we support what we do is uh, from people who choose to donate to support us, to... Uh, Help us to move the tools around the planet. As I said on Friday, we'll be doing a free Why Is This Happening to Me Again workshop from 6.30 until 10 o'clock in uh, Asheville at uh, oh, Hosanna. Hosanna Cafe, just across from the uh, the monument in Asheville, right in downtown Asheville, North Carolina. Just uh, not far from the parking garage. So come and join us there. If you want to come earlier, 5 o'clock for dinner, that'd be cool. We also will be starting, actually, we'll be flying out of here on uh, Saturday back to Kansas City, a couple days in Kansas City, and we'll be heading to uh, Heartland. And on the 18th of July, we'll be, getting, be beginning a nine-day 
why is this happening to me again? Nene, we're delighted you're coming to join us for teacher's training. So Nene will be there from the 18th for the next uh, 17 days. Uh, the teacher's training includes the nine-day wide intensive and then eight days of teacher training. Or for those who have done a nine-day Y previously, it's a nine-day teacher training that they can come to. That will be the second workshop we'll do. Then we're going into Laws of Living. We also have scheduled uh, Course in Miracles and Intuitive Development. I'm not sure that we're going to move forward with those two intensives. At this point, uh, registration is low, and so they may be canceled. If people decide to jump on board and want to do them, then we'll be certainly moving forward with those. So it's... Uh, you can go to the website, and if you look under schedules, you'll see the Heartland Intensive. And by the way, Heartland is a residential retreat center. It used to be a resort in the Ozarks. Been there, oh, 22 years now, going on 22 years, a long time. And people come and will live there for the duration of the intensive or intensives they choose to participate in. And uh, food, accommodations, workshops, workshop materials, everything totally included, and we do this awesome gourmet vegetarian food, is $175 a day. So a nine-day intensive is $15.75. I know people that are charging that for a one-day workshop when they offer you water at the back of a hotel room. And, uh, so you know, it's pretty reasonably priced and covers everything, and there's just some awesome work that gets done in that room. You've been there, Tim. Anything to share about the awesome work that happens in that classroom at Heartland? Well, um and the best way that I talk to people about it is to say that within my 30-some years of experience going to seminars and trainings and retreats, it was by far the best and the most um, well-spent money and um, the cheapest for the value of any training I've ever been to. And I can't recommend it too highly. It's just, it's fabulous. It would be awesome to see a, a van load of folks come down from Chicago for uh, for one of those intensives this summer. That would be cool. We're actually going to have this. It's, they're going to be um, kind of extra intense, extra attention intensives because they're going to be smaller groups than what we normally have the last three years with the economy being the way it is or the three smallest years we've had at Heartland in 22 years of operation. And uh, so... We're anticipating small groups, so they're going to be some pretty intense work that will take place. And by the way, Tim, when you get there, you're going to be pleasantly surprised to see what's happened to the Heart Center. The, the renovations have just been awesome. David and Terry and uh, Paolo from England and uh, various other folks from around the uh, Heartland area who've assisted. And we've got some huge pine, um, pardon me, cedar logs that we've put into the heart center, taking the post out of the center of the room, six new bathrooms. I mean, it's it's really looking really, really spiffy, as they say. So I'm looking forward Gee, to seeing it. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's really coming together nicely. It's it's uh, amazing and awesome what uh, what everybody's done to uh, to make that happen. So, Ginny, any other questions in the chat room or anybody calling in? We've got a couple minutes left. We have less than a minute, but Nene makes the comment that she had actually watched the Getting the Stress You Need, which you mentioned, and that she watched it last Monday, and she's been canceling goals now for 10 days. And she understood it better, and then all of a sudden things just started falling apart. But she said she's so happy to hear from you and I, and today she finds herself in zero, I'm assuming that means zero stress. She said it was the, quote, experience of my life, unquote, besides giving birth to Lucy. And I look from, forward to doing more and more workshops in Spanish. So she was, I think she's referencing the experience of her life was when you all did the Spanish and English workshop. Awesome. Well, that's delightful. And, you know, when you get to new levels of vitality, be aware the next layer of healing comes up. It is not always Dr. Feelgood. The reason it's all been hidden away and made a belief system about somebody you pray to rather than a body of work that you do is uh, because who wants to dig in there and do that? But the rewards are awesome, and they will assist you in creating the best year yet of your eternal life. Blessings. 
Thank you for listening to Mind Shifters Radio with the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice and his wife, Jeannie, who present the internal Aramaic process of forgiveness. Michael and Jeannie are here every Monday through Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Earth Angels Radio. For more on Michael and Jeannie, please visit www.mindshifters.com. Why again dot com that's www dot w h y a g a i n dot com.